Hello, everyone, and thank, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Marianne Levitsky, a certified industrial hygienist with ECHO. And uh, my co-presenters today are Michelle Mendoza and Lisa Scolaro. We sent you biographical notes in the invitation, so I won't take the time to go through that now. I'll just uh, start the presentation if I, there we go. So this is what we want to cover today. Uh, we'll be talking about what is a respiratory protection program and the legislation in Ontario that applies, some key components of your respiratory protection program, and then how ECHO can help, and then open it up to you for questions and answers. So what is a respiratory protection program? Well, in a nutshell, it's a written program that sets out how the employer will ensure that respirators are properly used to protect workers. It is a legal requirement in Ontario and the legislation does, does set out what it must include. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the relevant legislation. So, in addition to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which has a general duty to protect workers and provide equipment, there are two regulations that specifically mention respiratory protection program. Those are the control of exposure to biological or chemical agents, regulation 833, and the designated substances regulation, reg 49009. And I have the sections on this slide. And essentially what it says is an employer who provides a worker with a respirator shall establish written measures and procedures regarding the selection, care and use of respirators. So it is those written measures and procedures that comprise your respiratory protection program. In addition, the regulations use uh, reference to CSA, Canadian Standards Association standards. Uh, for particular sections relevant to the regulations. One is the compressed breathing air standard for air supplied through supplied air respirators. And then it references Canadian standard Z94.4, uh, selection use and care of respirators. And it re references those standards in regard to respirator selection and also fit testing. So what does the legislation say about when must a respirator be provided? Well, it does emphasize that respirators are not the first line of defense. You are probably familiar with the hierarchy of controls in occupational hygiene. Uh, so employers must try to control exposure through all the other elements of the hierarchy, such as engineering controls, administrative controls, et cetera. But the regs do say that when exposure cannot be sufficiently controlled through those other means, that the employer must provide a respirator. And it sets out details about when a respirator can or must be used as a means of controlling exposure. And those elements are listed in the regulations. It includes an emergency or other controls are not available or feasible uh, under the circumstances. The designated substance regulation also says that when an exposed worker asks for a respirator, the employer must provide it. Um, so if a respirator must be provided under the regulations, then that section about measures and procedures or a respiratory protection program is required. There's another element of the regulations that relate to health screening. And the regulations say that a worker shall not be assigned to an operation requiring a respirator unless the worker is physically able to perform the operation while using it. So this implies that health screening and possibly medical assessment are required. So what must a respiratory protection program include? Well, it must, as we said, selection, care, and use of respirators. So, the respirator selected must be approved by NIOSH or another relevant body. Uh, it must be appropriate to the hazard. And this implies that a risk assessment to determine what is appropriate must be done. Uh, we mentioned compliance with breathing air standards for atmosphere supplying respirators, covers use, care and maintenance and fit testing. It also requires worker training and it needs to include program administration, evaluation, and documentation. So those are the 
elements of a respiratory protection program as required under the legislation. And my colleagues are going to tell you about details of some of those requirements. Before we get to that, I did want to point out that the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development has an ongoing respiratory protection program inspection initiative now, and they've said it would go till the end of this month, March. And this is directly from their website, so you can find out about it uh, for yourself on that, at that link. And it says that ministry hygienists will conduct proactive inspections in all workplaces where respirators are provided and used by workers. And the inspections will ensure that a written respiratory protection program is in place. And it will also look at these other elements, selection, training, fit testing where needed, and re requirements for supplied air. So with that, I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Scalaro, who's going to take you through more details of those key components of a respiratory protection program. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, just to regurgitate a little bit what Marianne has also already talked about, um, today we're going to cover some of those key components that a respiratory protection plan needs to have in, the, in it in order to be in compliance with um, legislation. So we're going to talk in a little more detail about each of these in the subsequent slides. Lisa, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you for that. I must have clicked that when I was trying to get the slides to go. Apologies. Um, so the very first portion of a respiratory protection plan is the completion of a risk assessment. So essentially, the completion of a risk assessment helps employers to determine if there actually is a respiratory hazard to their employees. So it's essentially a very detailed examination of the work processes at each facility to determine what respiratory hazard may exist. There are four key components of a risk assessment that um, need to be gone through to determine uh, the next steps. So the very first part of any risk assessment includes an, a hazard and identification. So this is a determination of any contaminants that may be present in the workplace. So this could be chemical contaminants, it could be biological contaminants. Um, also to keep in mind, you are going to be considering both products that you use in your manufacturing processes, as well as those that you may create on site. So if you're manufacturing chemicals, those materials that you are um, manufacturing are also included in your hazard identification. Um, to complete a hazard identification, you will be doing a very thorough observation of everything that goes on in your facility in tandem with reviews of safety data sheets, observing uh, work or processes, and so on. So getting a very good general overview of what potential hazards are there. So once you've determined that there is a potential for a hazard, the next step would be uh, characterization of that hazard. So essentially determining the physical state of any contaminants. Okay, so are they a respiratory hazard as a gas, as a particulate? Are they a vapor, a fume, et cetera? Okay, so this becomes very important because it helps to assess what the potential for um, occupational exposure is, how to further control for it further down the road, and so on. Okay, so determining what that state is. Once you've determined what the state of the hazard is, the third step would be your exposure assessment. So essentially, in the case of a respiratory hazard, you're looking at completing some air sampling. Okay, so measuring the concentrations of your contaminants present in air. Okay, so once you have completed your exposure assessment, you have some sample results, some data, you can take that data and do a full risk characterization which essentially is um, comparing the values or the airborne uh, concentrations of your contaminants 
to occupational exposure limits. Okay, so what does legislation or guidelines say is acceptable for levels of that contaminant to be present in air? Okay, so essentially, um, these are this is the very first step that you go through in order to make those determinations. So once you've made those determinations, you've done your hazard assessment, you've considered the hierarchy of controls that Marianne spoke to, um, and you've still determined that you do need respir uh, respira respirators for your workers, there are some considerations that you need to think about before you assign your workers respirators. Um, so this is a, a non-exhaustive list. Just tried to put a few examples on here about a few things that should be considered. Um, your respiratory protection plan will also include um, details about how you select respirators um, and all of those things need to be included. So a um, few things that you should consider, um, basically what's a respirator being used for? Are you doing things where there's uh, oxygen deficient atmospheres or is it for firefighting or so on? Or is it simply for protection for workers maybe working on a manufacturing line? Tied into that is determining what the nature of the uh, chemical or the contaminant is. So making sure that you refer back to any of your safety data sheets, um, doing some detailed research on that chemical determining um, how much is present in the air, potentially the warning properties. So how and when is that chemical detected? Things like that. Okay, um, consideration given to uh, whether it's one contaminant or several. Okay, so determining exactly how many different contaminants that you may be controlling for. Um, considering what state that contaminant is in. Okay, is it a particulate or is it a gas or a vapor? That helps determine the type of respirator that we will be selecting. Um, considering the amount or the airborne levels and whether they're at the exposure limit, above it, slightly below, um, doing a, a thorough investigation into the levels that are present. Okay. Um, another thing to consider is the health effects of the contaminant. Okay, so is it um, potentially lethal if someone um, were to be exposed to it? Is it irritating to eyes? Can it be absorbed through skin? So as well as tying into the type of respirator that you may need, it may also trigger some of the other um, per personal protective equipment that you may need to consider to protect your workers as well. Um, looking at some of the characteristics, of the operation or the process where, where your employees will need to have a respirator. So are they working in a very hot environment or perhaps in a very dusty environment or in a confined space? That will all play into your selection as well. Um, the next two tie in together a little bit. So the activities that the worker will be doing while wearing the respirator, as well as how long. So this is something to consider um, for comfort factors as well. Okay, so um, certain types of respirators may be a little bit more comfortable to wear long term and when they're doing physically demanding work. Um, and then looking at the respirator and if it's appropriate for the specific worker that's wearing it. Okay, so a little bit of personal selection as well. And then looking at your emergency egress to ensure that if somebody needs to evacuate and wear a respirator for evacuation, how far do they need to go um, and what other considerations. So again, this is a very, very subjective uh, list. There's many other things to consider. You can appreciate that selecting a respirator is not necessarily cut and dry and may require a little bit of input from some professionals, um, consulting documents such as the CSA guideline, lots of things to put into consideration. So tying into selecting your respirator, 
is the different types of classes of respirators that are available for your use. Um, the two main types of respirators, we have um, air purifying and supplied air respirators. So they do both work a little bit differently. Um, the air purifying work by simply removing contaminants by a filtration or by adsorbent. So they work typically with a cartridge type system. So the most common one that the ones that we see are the half and full face. You can see those little schematics at the bottom there. Um, also to keep in mind, your N95 masks as well are considered an air purifying respirator. Um, so that kind of sometimes gets lost in translation, but they are a type of respirator that um, if you are assigning them to workers, do need to be accounted for in your respiratory protection plan. Um, as I mentioned, these air purifying respirators, they do work by filtration or absorption. Um, so they do have cartridges or filters attached to them that need to be replaced on a regular basis. Um, so the reason we do this is to ensure that they continue to work and to filter out the contaminant that you're protecting for. So um, your uh, replacement it's typically and how you deal with cartridges and filters is typically included in your respiratory protection plan as well. Um, we basically we want to prevent breakthrough. So breakthrough is when you have a chemical contaminant that the worker is now able to sense while wearing the respirator. OK, so the chemical is basically broken through the barrier, which is saying that that cartridge life has come to its end. Um, when we're looking at particulates, when we get um, an overload of particulates on our filters, it becomes very difficult to breathe when wearing a respirator. So that's usually used as an indicator for um, overloading and end of life on particulate filters. Um, so to flip over to supplied air respirators. Um, so supplied air respirators, they are not removing contaminants by filtration. They are supplying the wearer wear with clean air from um, either a compressed air tank that the worker is equipped with or through an airline that is attached to them. Okay, so it's meant to provide fresh breathing air within the respirator for the person that is wearing it. Um, the equipment for a supplied air respirator includes usually um, either a full or half face piece respirator or a hood or a helmet for that worker to wear. So I'm just going to pause here and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Michelle Mendoza, and she will go over all the details that you need to know on respirator fit testing. All right, I'm just oh, trying to get my camera back. Just give me one second. Uh, let's just bear with me one moment. Can't seem to. There. Okay, hi everybody. Okay, so I'm just briefly gonna give everyone a high level overview of fit testing. So fit testing is performed on tight fitting respirators. So those would be your, for example, your N95s, your half face respirators, and your full face respirators. And the purpose of this is to verify whether the type of respirator that you've selected is appropriate for the worker. So, you know, there's different kinds of makes and models, even sizes. So someone with a larger face versus smaller face, that's very important to make sure that, for example, in this photo, this gentleman, if he's wearing, if he has a larger face, he's, you don't want to issue him a small respirator or vice versa. So with fit testing, we're demonstrating there's an effective seal made between the respirator and the user. So when that respirator is adhering to your skin. Um, parts of the re respirator fit test include donning and doffing. So donning is just a fancy way to say how you wear it. And then doffing is how you, uh, just another fancy way of uh, taking the respirator off. So how you wear the respirator and how you remove the respirator. Um, performing a seal check. So different makes and models of masks have different masks and respirators rather have different ways to perform a seal check, just depending. Sometimes there's a slight 
variance in their design, but we basically want to check for positive pressure and negative pressure. So positive, we're pushing air, we're exhaling out of the respirator to make sure it, it's not popping off. And then negative pressure would be inhaling to make sure that it's sucking in, but it's not um, allowing any of those contaminants to get in while you're inhaling. And then as well to how you would uh, inspect the respirator. So these are all the components of the fit testing training. Um, there's two types of fit testing, quantitative and qualitative, and we'll go in a little bit more detail in the following slides. Um, the CSA standard that Marianne had alluded to outlines the conditions for carrying out a fit test. So they're outlined here. So we do fit testing. Um, we start with an initial screening um, and provide fit testing before we provide the user with a respirator. So that's a key thing. We can't just have someone start wearing a respirator without giving the, the appropriate training. Um, we also need to carry this out if the person's physical condition changes. So for example, if the individual has significant weight loss, weight gain, facial changes to their face or dental features. So maybe they've broken their nose or had some jaw surgery that would affect the, the way that a respirator could potentially adhere to that person's face. Um, like I said previously, we wanna make sure if there's a change in a respirator make and model. So for example, with the um, COVID pandemic, a lot of these hospitals had seen a particular N95 mask and those had been discontinued. So just because you're fit tested to, you know, the regular, this particular N95, like those cup sheet ones um, in the previous slides, if there's a new make and model, it may look the same. We still need to do fit testing to make sure that this new model is appropriate for your face. Um, if the user has come back to you and saying that they're experiencing any discomfort or difficulty breathing with a respirator or forming a seal, then we need to take another, sorry, complete another fit test. Um, if there are changes to the PPE that could affect um, the respirator, so if you need to wear safety glasses or visors, um, then we wanna make sure while you're wearing that, that they're still a proper seal around the user. And fit testing needs to be done every two years or if, if the user has any physical changes to their condition, so whichever comes first, but at least needs to be done every two years. Um, another important part of fit testing is making sure that the respirator wearer has a clean seal, so they're clean shaven where that respirator fits to their face and neck, so not just here, but as well people, some gentlemen might have um, on the stubble on their neck, so we wanna make sure that that is also clean shaven. Ideally, it's within 24 hours of completing a fit test. And obviously when you're wearing a respirator, um, the preferable time is 12 hours, but individuals vary. So we say between 12 to four hours, but 12 to 24 hours rather, that you should be clean shaven before wearing a respirator and performing your fit test. So these are just a couple of examples. I pulled this from the uh, CDC of facial hairstyles that are appropriate and not appropriate for wearing uh, respirators. So just to talk about the types of fit testing, the first one we'll kind of go over is qualitative fit testing. So this is based on the user's ability to detect the testing agent. So we use four different kinds of agents and these are outlined in the CSA standard. Irritant and smoke, which um, is pictured at the bottom right of the screen. That is a bit of a, it is a eye hazard. So if you are going to be using irritant smoke as part of your qualitative fit testing, you wanna make sure that the user um, has some eye protection so that they don't get irrit their, any irritation to their eyes while the test is being performed. Vitrex, which is a bitter solution, isoamyl acetate, which tastes like banana, and saccharin, which is a sweet solution. So the latter three, um, you use a nebulizer and you spray that and you wanna see whether or not the user can taste that. So if you're doing any of the uh, three um, testing agents below, so vitrex, isoamyl acetate, or saccharin, what typically happens is the tester will do a sensitivity test to make sure that the, re the respirator user can actually detect what's gonna be going on the, in the hood. So they take a less strong version and spray that into the user's mouth, and then that will give them an idea of what it will be. And it's usually 10 times more in intensity is the actual spray solution. So how qualitative fit testing works is after you've completed that um, sensitivity test, you're gonna wear the respirator and then you're gonna wear 
a hood. So you can see that on the upper right hand corner. Um, and then the tester will introduce the substance. There's just a little opening and we'll spray that solution into the hood. And while the spray is, um, sorry, while the tester introduces the spray, the user will do a couple of different activities. So starting with normal breathing, deep breathing, turning your head side to side, talking, bending over or jogging, and then returning to normal breathing. So the purpose of that is to simulate the conditions where you would be wearing a respirator and how your mouth and your face may change during those type of activities. And during that test, the intensity of the spray or the smoke will increase. So typically at the end, it will be really, really strong. And what you want is to make sure that the user doesn't taste anything throughout that duration of the test. Um, so that's that would be a considered pass if they didn't taste anything until at, um, at the very end. So the advantage of this type of testing is that you can do multiple people at a time. You can do up to five people. Um, some disadvantages though are that it relies on the user's ability to detect the test substance. So if you for some reason like burn your taste buds, like I know like I'm a very fan of hot sauce, so I can't really taste too much of that bitter spray. The sensitive, sensitivity test, um, the tester might have to spray a few more times before you can test that actual sensitivity before you can even detect that test substance. And this is not appropriate for those supplied respirators that Lisa had mentioned. The other type of fit testing is quantitative fit testing. So that's using a machine, uh, a type of particle counter to determine whether the respirator is the correct one. So what happens is the particle counter will compare the air inside the respirator versus outside and that will achieve a score. So you're gonna be performing the same exercises with the addition of grimacing um, to this type of fit testing. So each exercise is about one minute in length. So for example, you'd be doing one minute of normal breathing followed by one minute of deep breathing, so on and so forth. So it does take a bit of time and there is about 15 seconds or so of a lag between each test so that the machine can calculate the result for the previous test. At the end of the, the different types of tests, you're gonna get a fit factor score and if you score over 100, let's say for half-face respirators, and that includes the N95s, then it's considered a pass. And for full-face respirators, if you achieve a fit factor of at least 500, then that's considered a pass. So the disadvantage of this type of respirator is that you can only do this one person at a time. And each type of respirator model needs to have an adapter so that can be connected to the actual respirator. And I think I'll hand that back to Lisa for training and maintenance. Excellent, thank you, Michelle. Okay, so another very important piece of your respiratory protection program is do the training and maintenance component for those respirators. So essentially, as part of your respiratory protection program, you will be writing a piece that includes how you train what it includes and what your maintenance activities look like. Essentially, any training that you do should mirror what you're saying you're doing in that respiratory protection program. But overall, what regulations say is that before you give any work or respirator, they must be trained on that respirator. At minimum, there are five key pieces that need to be included in any training module for respirators. Um, so the first one is the care and use of the respirator. Okay, so um, the appropriate way to use that respirator, to handle that respirator, and so on. So very overarching, um, but basically the appropriate way to care and use that. The second component of any training is the limitations of the respirator that you are issuing to your workers. So when a worker is issued a respirator, they need to know what it is being used to control for. Okay, so if a worker is issued a half-face respirator to control for particulates or dust in a workplace, they should be made to know that that is what it's for and it's not appropriate that they can use that respirator um, in perhaps an oxygen deficient atmosphere. 
So making them aware of exactly what that respirator is used for and what it is not acceptable for. Um, the third piece is the inspection and maintenance of the respirators, including your the proper storage. Okay, so how do do does each user how do they properly inspect it pre post use? Um, what are they looking for for deficiencies? Um, what happens if they find a deficiency and so on? Also, how they're maintaining it. Okay, so. Um, ensuring that they know it's not acceptable to just toss it onto the floorboards behind the seats of their car when they're done at the end of the day, um, teaching them how to properly take care of that respirator, what to do to ensure that it continues to work as it's designed for. Um, the fourth piece would be the proper donning, doffing, so um, putting on the respirator and removing the respirator. Um, as well as the proper fitting of the respirator. Okay, so you need to be working with your employees to so they can show you that they can properly take the respirator on and off, um, as well as how to do seal checks once that respirator is on prior to them using it. Okay, so your uh, positive and negative um, seal checks to ensure that the respirator has made a proper seal on their face prior to them entering the atmosphere where the contaminant may be present. Okay, so that should all be part of the um, training as well. And then the last piece is the proper cleaning and disinfecting of the respirator. Okay, so training your staff on acceptable ways to um, clean, do a thorough cleaning of it, um, end of shift cleaning, how to properly wipe it down, acceptable, um, cleaning materials to use and so on. So again, really tying into that proper care of that respirator. Now, training needs to occur whenever a worker is issued a respirator. So that training must occur. Now, retraining should also occur whenever there is a change in the workplace or the type of respirator used. Okay, so if you have decided to go from perhaps a half face to a full face respirator, all of your employer employees now need to be re retrained on the proper use. Um, if there's a change in your manufacturing or processes at your work facility, retraining should occur again. Um, and then the other thing is, if you have an employee that shows um, that maybe they have forgotten some of the training that they have been provided. Okay, so perhaps they have started uh, not doing their seal checks, maybe they aren't properly cleaning the respirator, or they're just showing that maybe there's some inadequacy in their knowledge, that would trigger a need to retrain as well. Um, health screening. So Marianne did mention the health screening as part of her um, portion of the presentation. Just to re uh, reiterate, the health screening is um, necessary prior to uh, issuing a respirator and performing fit testing. Essentially, the purpose of health screening is to confirm that a worker does not have any condition that may prevent them from safely wearing a respirator. Um, this is typically done through a health screening form with very open-ended generic questions. I provided a snapshot here that you can see. Essentially in the bottom right of the screen, um, you can see that there is a bunch of different um, health concerns or conditions listed. You're not asking workers to uh, tell you if they specifically which conditions they have. It's simply a yes or no. Uh, answer to whether or not one of these conditions may apply to them. Now, in the case of a worker that answers yes, that they do have something that uh, is a precursor to them potentially safely wearing a respirator, what it does is triggers the need for that employee to go seek medical evaluation before you issue that respirator. So essentially, they need to go see their medical their medical doctor and they need to get um, that medical evaluation that says it's acceptable for them to wear a respirator or any conditions that they may have for the use of that respirator.
Um, one of the last pieces of the respiratory protection program is uh, the program administration, evaluation, and record keeping piece. So one thing to keep in mind is that your respiratory protection program must be regularly reviewed. Okay, so it's not enough to just write it and shelve it. It needs to be reviewed on a regular basis. Um, many times annually is what a lot of employers do, but basically you need to show that you're regularly considering it and making changes as necessary. Um, it also needs to indicate the responsibilities for different positions within your workplace. Okay, so what are the roles and responsibilities for the employer, for the supervisors, for the workers, and so on? So very clearly laying out what each person has a responsibility for when it comes to respiratory protection. Tied into that, everyone needs to be trained on what their roles and responsibilities are. Okay, so if you're saying that um, that your workers are responsible for maintaining their respirator in a clean and uh, working condition, they need to be told that. Okay, so ensuring that the roles and responsibilities are um, communicated to all. Um, record keeping is also very important when we look at respiratory protection programs. So all records that relate to any kind of respirator use and training that is done in the workplace needs to be maintained. Okay, so any records of fit testing need to be maintained. Um, if you have your employees acknowledging the respirator use and the selection as well as the training, those need to be maintained. Um, any maintenance logs or change out schedules for cartridges need to be maintained as well. And then uh, medical evaluations, they do need to be maintained, but they are maintained as a confidential document. So not something that is handed out to everybody, but maintained in an employee file, uh, perhaps with human resources. So that wraps up the details of what you need to include in your respiratory protection program. I'd like to now introduce you to our ECHO team and what we can do to help you achieve a well-working uh, respiratory protection program. So if you're not familiar with us, um, ECHO is an acronym for Environmental Consulting and Occupational Health and Safety. And we were founded in 2000, so we have about a 20 year plus history now. Um, we currently service, um, we have service hubs in Mississauga and Ottawa with over 75 employees, many of which are professionally accredited. So on our team, we have um, several staff that have been accredited. We have uh, five occupational hygienists, we have several that have the CRSP designation, so very well-rounded team. We currently serve a wide range of industries, um, everything from residential to um, industrial manufacturing, and we're very easily able to um, take any of the health and safety challenges that you may have in your workplace, be them respiratory protection or, or other, and we can help you assist, we can assist you with coming to some solutions. Um, so ECHO as a whole, we do have three areas of expertise. We have our environmental division, which is your traditional um, environmental and remediation group. We have our hazardous materials group where um, the team prepares designated substance surveys, asbestos oversight, asbestos um, surveys, and so on. And then you have our occupational health and safety group, which um, all three of us are part of. This is our group where our hygienists reside. We do um, a whole range of uh, different things to service you, including um, occupational and industrial hygiene surveys, we can do risk assessments, we can do health and safety program development. So how does that tie back to um, respiratory protection in your workplace? There is very uh, a, quite a few areas that we can help you to ensure that your workers are protected um, and that their respiratory health is maintained. 
So first and foremost, we can help uh, perform those hazard and risk assessments to determine what uh, may be present as a contaminant in your workplace. Okay, so we're more than happy to do site, site visits. We're more than happy to do um, review of SDS sheets and work with you um, to determine what potential hazards may be there. We also do the exposure assessments. So our team is very robust with our air sampling experience. So that's something we can assist with to determine um, if there's any exposure to any various contaminants. We're able to help with measures to control respiratory hazards, whether that's recommendations for some of those hierarchy of controls or helping you determine the correct um, PPE that you might need, including respiratory um, selection and um, cartridge selection and so on. We're able to perform some training. Okay, so if you if you need some help with, uh, with training regarding respirators and the use of them, we're more then happy to help with that. Um, we can do fit testing. We can definitely assist with that. Um, and then regarding your respiratory protection program, now this is, it is mandatory, as I mentioned, if you do issue respiratory uh, respirators in your workplace, and it is uh, your duty and your requirement as an employer to put this together. However, we're more than happy, happy to assist you pull together your respiratory protection program and ensure that it works for your, your workplace. So that wraps up uh, the information piece uh, that we'd like to present to you. Um, at this point, we'd like to turn it over to a Q&A session. Yes, so um, I have been looking at the chat. I don't see anything there currently. So if you guys do have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A section and we'll start answering them out loud. Um, please also feel free to use the raise your hand function if you would like to us to unmute you so you can ask your question verbally. <clears throat> okay, so first one, in terms of fit testing, in addition to being clean shaven to accommodate a respiratory a respiratory sealing surface, would facial piercings be of any concern? Nose rings, dimple for chin, et cetera? Um, maybe I can respond to that. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, the CSA standard, which is quite detailed about fit testing, and I would encourage people to look at it, uh, does say that uh, anything that you uh, normally wear, if you're going to be wearing it at work, you should be wearing it during fit testing. For example, glasses or something like that, you should be wearing it um, during the fit testing. Now, in terms of jewelry, uh, it really depends where on your face it is or other facial features. Uh, if it interferes with the seal, we would probably have to say, you cannot, if it can be removed, you cannot wear it while you're wearing a respirator. It's possible it is someplace where it would not interfere with the seal. But if your facial features are such uh, that you cannot get a good fit with a tight fitting respirator, um, if you're testing one model, you should, uh, the tester should try another model. But if it is impossible to get a good fit with any model, uh, the employer may need to look at alternatives uh, to a tight fitting respirator, such as a powered air purifying respirator or something like that. So the basic rule is uh, wear what you would normally wear at work when you are wearing a respirator. And while I mention that, it's maybe a good time to let people know it's a really good idea to become familiar with the CSA standard that we mentioned, Z94.4, if you have to develop a respiratory protection program. It's quite a complex standard. And as Lisa said, we'd be happy to help you with the details, but you can view the standard at no cost, uh, uh, not, not to download it, but to view it. And the Ministry of Labor has a link to where you can view it on the CSA website and you would need to sign up with them, but you could view it at no cost. So I hope that answers that question. Thanks for that really good question. Awesome, next question we have, um, this one's directed to Michelle. Michelle, can you explain what use, what the user has to do for grimacing during the qualitative uh, quantitative fit testing and why is it done? 
Yeah, so grimacing is like making a sad face. I don't know if I want to make a grimacing face. It's like, like one of those. <laughs> so you're going to have to do that for about one minute. And the purpose of that, similar to all the other activities, is how does that affect your um, the seal between the respirator and your face while your face is changing? So certainly when you're speaking or maybe you know, different, you remember you're reacting to something at work and you might make a face change and wearing that respirator, could that potentially break the seal between your face, um, the respirator and, and the user's face to make sure that nothing is, that shouldn't be going in, goes in. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, and then another question we have, is a respiratory protection a requirement or recommended for exterior concrete demolition? Do, do you want me to yeah, go for take that, that folks? Yeah, okay. Um, well, for that, I would expect that in such a situation, the worker would probably be exposed to silica as well as other hazards. So I would urge you to look at the ministry's guideline for uh, silica. And uh, there may be other hazardous contaminants in that situation. Generally, the regulations, as I mentioned before, say, the employer must look to other kinds of controls first. Uh, of course, in a situation like that, we don't know to the extent to which other kinds of controls would be satisfactory uh, to control that exposure. So it's kind of hard to answer that question in the abstract without knowing the circumstances, what other controls are feasible. Uh, for example, if the worker was in an enclosed cab then that was filtered, then respiratory protection might not be needed. But that is a perfect example of where a risk assessment is required uh, to determine whether A, other controls are feasible, and B, whether respiratory protection is needed. If I had to take a guess in the absence of any other information, I would say yes it's probably would be a good idea to have respiratory protection, but I would encourage an employer to look at all those other questions first. Awesome, thank you. Um, those are all the questions that I'm currently seeing in the q and I'm not seeing anything additional in the chat, so I will give attendees one last chance to raise their hand if they have any questions or submit them to the Q&A. Otherwise, our presenters do have their emails all on the screen currently. So if you would like to reach out to any of them, feel free to do so using these emails. And otherwise, we do wanna thank you very much for your time today. Um, we appreciate you all taking time out of your day to learn about the requirements for your respiratory program. Um, if you missed your questions or you had anything additional to share with us, please feel free to reach out to us at learning at echo.ca or to any of the presenters directly via the emails on the screen. Um, otherwise, uh, we do ask, please, that you submit the survey that you're going to see following the exit of this meeting. Your feedback is very important to us. Um, and thank you again. We hope to see you soon.